Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you as we gather together for this service of worship from Emmanuel Church Northwood. It's great to be able to welcome you, whether you are a Emmanuel regular or whether you're connecting with us online for the very first time. It is great to be able to welcome you as we gather together for worship together this morning. As we begin our time together, we do, of course, have a number of quick notices. The first is about our Sunday service pattern in lockdown. Um, We have once again had to change our service pattern for this period of lockdown. And so for this month, we're having a 9 o'clock and 10.30 services, both of which you can access through our YouTube channel, and then a 5.30 p.m. service, which is available via Zoom, and that's a live service. We also have kids' work and youth work available. You can find more details about that on our YouTube channel and also on our website. The second thing to say is that this Sunday also gives sees another opportunity for us to connect together as a church family. We're going to be hosting another Zoom coffee morning. This is taking place at 11.30 via Zoom. Uh, details of how you can join in with this were in our church email, which was sent to you on Friday, and again in the email that you will have received in your inbox this morning. The next thing to say is that in this month of lockdown, we're having a particular prayer focus, a prayer focus which is an opportunity for us to engage wider with our community as we open our church for prayer from 12 to 1 p.m. each weekday. And of course, any and everyone is welcome to join in with that. But there's also an opportunity for us to pray each Thursday in November. This is at 6 p.m. via Zoom, and it's an opportunity for us as a church family to gather together for half an hour for intensive prayer, to pray for our nation and our world at this time. Also, for those of you who had signed up for New Wine, you'll have now received an email um, explaining that New Wine, unfortunately, has had to be cancelled this summer. But New Wine is still planning for a United event, which is going to be online. And this is going to be taking place from the 29th of July through to the 3rd of August. We as a church will be engaging with that online content, um, but we'll also, as a church, be planning on moving our deposits to secure our places for United in the summer of 2022. Finally, let me just say a quick response to our gift day. We're in the midst of a gift season at the moment, two weeks where we're asking us as a church family to respond to a need, a particular need to fulfill and meet our deficit in our budget for this year, but also an opportunity for us to look at afresh, uh, to look afresh at our monthly giving and whether it's an opportunity for us to respond to that call to increase our regular monthly giving. And first of all, I've got some great news to share, and that is that thanks to our generosity, we have received enough money now to to meet that deficit. And this is wonderful news and is much to give thanks to God for, but also a huge thank you to each and every one of you who've sacrificially given to meet this need. Thank you so very, very much. However, there is still an opportunity to respond, an opportunity for us to respond to God's call on us to be generous by giving one-off gifts if you haven't yet done that. Next year, we will be seeing a significant quinquennial works, um, quinquennial inspection works that we will need to still budget for and to finance. So your gifts, if you give, well, will go towards that. But we still also need to see an increase in our regular monthly giving. And so there's still an opportunity for us to be praying and asking the Lord how he's calling us to respond, whether we're a regular giver yet or not. But if you're not yet a regular giver, please can I encourage you to consider joining our monthly giving scheme and becoming a regular contributor to the work of God through Emmanuel Church. I think that's all of the notices that I need to say. So let's just be still for a moment as we prepare our hearts to come in worship and before we use our opening sentences. As we go through this service, there will be words that will appear on your screen. Please can I encourage you to respond at home with the words that will be in bold type. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. 
So we're going to continue our time together now as we hear our first song of worship as Gareth leads us in the hymn, Lord for the Years. Lord for the years your love has kept and guided urged and inspired us cheered us on our way sought us and saved us pardoned and provided Lord of the years we bring our thanks today Lord for our land in this our generation spirits oppressed by pleasure wealth and care for young and old for and nation, Lord of our land, be pleased to hear our prayer. Lord, for our world, when we disown and doubt him, love less in strength and comfort in pain hungry and helpless lost indeed without him Lord of the world we pray that Christ may reign Lord for ourselves in Self on the cross and Christ upon the throne, past put behind us for the future. Take us, Lord of our lives, to live for Christ alone. Gareth, thank you so much for leading us. We come now to a time of confession. So let's be still for a moment and let's allow the Holy Spirit to bring to mind anything that we may need to say sorry to God for that we've done or should have done and didn't do in this week that's passed. Let's be still for a moment. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. So we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy upon us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So hear now and receive these words of forgiveness. So may the Father of all mercies forgive us, cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So as forgiven people, let's now affirm our faith together in using these words that will appear on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from God, light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. 
for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. He, on the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I'm going to invite Sarah now to come and bring us our reading, after which Nick will come and speak to us. This morning's readings come from Proverbs 14, verse 31, and Psalm 140. He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honours God. Rescue me, O Lord, from evil men. Protect me from men of violence, who devise evil plans in their hearts and stir up war every day. They make their tongues as sharp as a serpent's, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from men of violence who plan to trip my feet. Proud men have hidden a snare for me. They have spread out the cords of their net and have set traps for me along my path. O Lord, I say to you, you are my God. Hear, O Lord, my cry for mercy. O sovereign Lord, my strong deliverer, who shields my head in the day of battle. Do not grant the wicked their desires, O Lord. Do not let their plans succeed, or they will become proud. Let the heads of those who surround me be covered with the trouble their lips have caused. Let burning coals fall upon them. May they be thrown into the fire, in me into miry pits never to rise. Let slanderers not be established in the land. May disaster hunt down men of violence. I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Surely the righteous will praise your name and the upright will live before you. This is the word of the Lord. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Those words could have been written yesterday, but in fact, they were written in 1859. They come at the beginning of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. But they describe very well what we are experiencing, a winter of despair. The company that I work for is in the hospitality industry, and we're losing money hand over fist. After reopening in July, we were cautiously optimistic that if we had a good Christmas, we might even save the year. But the second lockdown was a real body blow. The pandemic's affected everybody. We've all been affected physically, mentally and emotionally. But today I want to think about how the pandemic has affected the poorest in society economically. The poor have borne the brunt of job losses, and they have the least resources to rely on. In September, the Trussell Trust, which runs Food Bank, released a report that forecast a 61% increase in food parcels needed across its UK network in October to December. It's amazing that in a rich country like the UK, food banks have become such an important part of our social provision. Things are bad in the UK. How about the rest of the world? I was watching a video put out by the charity Compassion about uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. 
And unsurprisingly, they've been suffering unemployment, hunger, malnutrition, and depression. And the poorest people are unable to afford the basic necessities of life. One person in Ethiopia said this, it's known that COVID is affecting everyone, but it is devastating for those who are in poverty. Around 10% of the world's population lives in extreme poverty, defined as living on less than $1.90 per day. And that's a total of 750 million people. There have been 50 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide so far, but physical illness is not the only effect of the pandemic. The World Bank has said that by the end of the year, the pandemic will have forced 100 million people into extreme poverty. 100 million. Twice as many has, has, have been infected with COVID-19. And extreme poverty like that is a death sentence. It's not an immediate death sentence, it's a slow death sentence. The poor, the extreme poor live comparatively short lives because of the conditions they live in. Drawing on the book of Ecclesiasticus in the Apocrypha, the South American theologian Gustavo Gutierrez encapsulated this in the phrase, the daily life of the poor is a death. Poverty obviously existed before COVID-19, but COVID-19 has created a humanitarian disaster on a monumental scale. Where is God in all this? The topic we are looking at today is God's heart for the poor. How can I begin to talk about God's heart for the poor in a winter of despair, when a hundred million people are sinking like a stone. The only thing I feel I can do is talk about Jesus. Jesus was poor. For the last three years of his life, he was effectively homeless. He identified with the poor, showing that there's no shame in being poor and that the poor are not poor because they've been rejected by God. He explained that he had come to bring a message of good news to the poor. In Luke chapter 4, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And in Luke chapter 6, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. He was definitely on the side of the poor. To many, he appeared to be preaching revolution. And that frightened the rich so much that they had him crucified. He was a problem they simply crushed. And I think we have to recognize that Jesus didn't change the conditions of the poor. He healed a few sick people, he fed a few thousand people, but he didn't change things dramatically for the poor. If you have a purely this world perspective, then Jesus failed to help the poor. But you have to factor in the resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead and the resurrection is a game changer. It provides the key to understanding God's heart for the poor. In the resurrection, Jesus was recreating the world as a transformed world free of poverty. And so the resurrection is therefore God's response to poverty. And that's why this morning in talking about poverty, I found myself drawn to the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm going to make three points about the resurrection the first one is Jesus' resurrection body is released from poverty, from the poverty that he endured in his lifetime. Secondly, 
Jesus' resurrection guarantees that the poor, all the poor, will be released from their poverty in a resurrection of the dead on the last day of history. And thirdly, Jesus' resurrection gives us an advance installment, a taste of resurrection life through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So firstly, Jesus' resurrection body is no longer subject to material poverty. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. The crucifixion of Jesus is followed by the resurrection. Jesus didn't just die on the cross. He rose from the dead. His tomb is empty. The resurrection of Jesus is evidence that Jesus was the divine Son of God. But it's much more than that. It's the beginning of a new creation. Death will no longer exist in the new creation. There's no clearer picture of freedom from death than the empty tomb of Jesus. This freedom isn't just a spiritual freedom from sin and death. The resurrection was a bodily resurrection, releasing the body of Jesus from death. And it's a bodily freedom, releasing the body from everything that makes the body suffer. Put simply, Jesus was hungry and thirsty in his life. Now he isn't. The resurrection body of Jesus is very strange. It's clearly the same body. It bears the marks of crucifixion, the scars of the nails in his hands and feet, the spear thrust to his side and heart and lungs. But Jesus isn't wincing with pain every time he puts a foot on the floor. He isn't struggling for breath because his lungs have been shredded by a Roman spear. His resurrection body is free from all bodily suffering because it has been transformed. Jesus died a weak, suffering human being, but he rose a glorious, triumphant human being. He's free in every conceivable sense, free from every kind of physical weakness, free from hunger, free from thirst, and free from poverty. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, writes this, to say he is risen is to say he is now free to act eternally, unceasingly, without limit. Death and its effects cannot hold him back. The final phase of human history is shaped, controlled by the liberty of Jesus. Obviously, this has enormous ramifications and implications in all sorts of ways. But for this morning's purposes, all we need to say is that the liberty of Jesus means that he is eternally free from poverty. For the risen Jesus, poverty has simply been obliterated. My second point is that what is true for Jesus is true for us. Jesus is the first human being to be raised from the dead, but he is not the last. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. 
Another great chapter about resurrection is Romans 6, where Paul writes in verse 5, If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. If we follow Jesus, we will follow him through death into resurrection life. We will all die, but at the end of human history, Jesus will raise us from the dead in a resurrection like his. And our bodies will be like Jesus' resurrection body. They'll be free from pain and suffering, and they'll be free from poverty. There's no poverty in the completed kingdom of God. As it says in Revelation 7, 16, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. They will share in Jesus eternal freedom from poverty. God is creating a world free from poverty but it's in the future. We don't experience it now. Or can we? When Jesus was raised from the dead, he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus was deliberately copying and repeating the act of God in the original creation. Genesis 2 verse 7 says, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. The risen Jesus places himself in the role of God in the new creation. He repeats this scripture. He breathes the Holy Spirit, the breath of life on his disciples. And, and the gift of the Holy Spirit means that the new creation has begun. We can experience something of resurrection life, not the whole package. We'll only experience it fully in the future, but, but we, the Spirit gives us an experience of that new life now. And when we put our trust in Jesus, he breathes his Holy Spirit into us just like he did into the first disciples. And the Holy Spirit assures us in our innermost being that everything is going to be all right. The Holy Spirit transforms our attitude to life. The Holy Spirit comforts us. The Holy Spirit gives us hope for the future. And the Holy Spirit inspires us to change our present so, in summary, God's heart is shown for the poor uh, by three things. He raised Jesus from the dead, he will raise us from the dead, and he has given us the Holy Spirit. But the fact remains that we live in a world which has 850 million people living in extreme poverty. The resurrection of Jesus gives us our ethical impetus and direction. It gives the church a mandate to serve people's physical needs, their bodily needs, as well as their spiritual needs. The bodily resurrection of Jesus shows that God is interested in the bodily needs of people. The resurrection gives us our mandate. The Holy Spirit gives us our, our power. On the compassion video that I watched about East Africa, it was obvious that the church has leapt into action to distribute food to the needy. A worker from Rwanda said, this is the time the church of God is standing up to show up in time of crisis and show people that there is hope. We must stand up and show up in time of crisis and show people that there is hope. Some of us are struggling 
actually all of us are struggling. We must pull together. First of all, we must ask the Holy Spirit to help us. We can do nothing in our own weakness. I invite you today to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you with hope, to fill you with comfort and compassion, and to give you power. We're called collectively to help the poor. And I, I'm so glad for everything done in this church, from food bank to supporting the Montgomery Heights Orphanage in Zimbabwe. And I want to thank everybody who gives their time and their money and their, their prayers to help this work. Let us not grow weary of doing good. I'm going to finish now with a story. Last year, before the pandemic, I went on a short-term mission trip to Uganda. And while I was there, I visited the Namatala slum on the outskirts of Mbali. And slums are really difficult places to visit. They, they produce such a range of emotions in me. Pity for the people forced to live there. Revulsion at the conditions in which they have to live. Despair at the existence of the slum. If I'm honest, thankfulness that I don't live there. But a desire to help. And self-loathing when I walk away at the end of the day. In the Namatala slum... It's so easy to turn to alcohol and prostitution, and that leaves children very vulnerable to exploitation. And I was visiting a daycare center for vulnerable young children. They were caring for about 30 children. And I got talking to a young woman who was holding a small boy in her arms. And he was, he was four years old, but he looked to me much younger than that because he was so thin, thin as a rake, spindly little arms and legs. And he was lying down, not moving, with his eyes shut. I honestly thought he must be dying. And I asked what his name was. His name was Shadrach. And I asked if I could pray for him. I'm well aware that the poor need much more than my prayers, but I also believe that when I pray, I am praying to the God who raised Jesus from the dead and cares for the bodily needs of the poor. And frankly, it was the only thing I could do. But I didn't know what to pray. But because his name was Shadrach, I prayed that God would bring him through the fiery trial that he was facing. And as I prayed, his lips parted in a huge smile. A broad grin erupted across his face. His eyes remained closed, but he, he grinned. And the woman holding him said, he is receiving the blessing. And this memory has stayed with me. It's a nice memory in some ways that the little boy Shadrach smiled when I prayed for him. But it also haunts me that he's lying there in that slum on the point of death. I'm haunted by my life compared with his. And all I can really say as I finish is that I believe Jesus, the Son of God, became poor in order to make Shadrach rich. Not in this life, but Jesus will raise him from the dead to live in the paradise of God. And that's why it's so wonderful to be a Christian. We have hope. Nick, thank you so much for speaking to us this morning and your challenging message. Let's just pray for a moment now as we respond to that message. 
Father, we ask that you'd come and fill each one of us afresh with your Holy Spirit this morning. And Holy Spirit, as you come and as you fill us, fill us with your hope, fill us with your life, fill us with your power, but also fill us with that vision of your kingdom, of that new creation that we are called to play our part in bringing on this earth. Lord, thank you that your heart is for the poor. Lord, I pray and ask that you would turn our hearts towards the poor too. And Lord, that you would show each one of us how you're calling us to respond. If we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Graham now, who's going to continue to lead us in our prayers. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In case you don't know me, I am Graham Fowler. I offer you a potted 70-year history of myself. I was born of Christian parents, went to the University of Life via the Royal Mail, a funeral company, and then driving minibuses for people with disabilities. And now I look after my great mum of 95 years. Great interest in transport matters has taken me all around the world and a, a, gift, a great gift from God. Being a Christian, mate, thanks to mum and dad, Emmanuel, but that great man who was promoted to glory last year, Herbert Hackett and Covenanters. With this in mind, I commence my prayers with a verse from Joshua 1. Be thou strong and very courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. A prayer for our country at this time. O oh Lord, at this time of coronavirus epidemic for our country, we remember those in the health service, the doctors and nurses, and the hope that the lockdown we and the uh, doctors and nurses I hope the lockdown we are all in and we abide by the rules that hospitals are not overwhelmed with patients. Be with those who are affected with the economic effect of the virus, the poorer parts of our country. I name a few places, Harlesden, Wilsden, Tottenham, East End of London, Liverpool, Lancashire and Yorkshire. I noticed uh, I mentioned yesterday of the t city of Hull as well. Durham, Sunderland and Newcastle. Nearer to home in Northwood, our biggest employer, Heathrow Airport, for those who have been laid off or in retail, hotels and taxi drivers. We hope with the vaccine on the horizon to give us hope, but not to be despondent if more time is needed. Amen. Now, a prayer for our world and its leaders. We pray for an American acceptance of their recent election results and that Mr. Trump accepts de defeat in the right way and that America moves on from all the violent action of recent weeks and encourage the police to check actions and the new government under President Joe Biden tackles some of the issues such as American poverty and the coronavirus. Be with our government here with, our, with negoti negotiations with Europe so we can trade in an amicable way and also look at ways to stem and help desperate refugees. We give thanks for Her, her Majesty the Queen and her family and her long reign. Be with our Prime Minister Boris Johnson as he leads our country and to overcome the arguments and his period of self-isolation at number 10 and realise that the country needs a united leadership, an example that, he, that goes for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. Amen. We pray for our local community. O oh Lord, be with our local uh, community, especially our Member of Parliament, David Simmons, and our councillors, Carol Melvin, Richard Lewis, Scott Seaman Digby in Norford, and Jonathan Bianco and Duncan Flink and John Morgan in Norford, North, Norford Hills. We remember those who drive our buses and trains, our postmen, our refuge collectors, and our street cleaners, and our local GP surgeries as they cope with COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients. The people who serve in our local 
supermarkets and shops, but be specially near, near with the people that work in the shops, cafes and restaurants who have had to close because of the lockdown. Amen. We now pray for our church. We give thanks for our church of Emmanuel here in Northwood and our wider Church of England. We bless our senior bishops, Justin Welby, Sarah Mullally and Pete Broadbent, and encourage them to talk to the government to bring our regular worship back to our churches and be able to sing carols at Christmas. We give thanks at Emmanuel that we always have excellent vicars and curates here, and today we remember Tim, Dave and Christine and their families, especially coming up to this business, busy Advent and Christmas season. We trust that the recent gift day will help relieve the deficit and we give thanks to the recent events, the worldwide uh, uh, event and the remembrance services. I especially give thanks for, the James, for James's video with some senior Emmanuel friends, including my mother, sharing their wartime memories for the children. We trust the new initiative uh, set up called Connect, and we trust that they will work, live up to that word, Connect. Amen. And to, to, towards the end of our prayers, I, I offer this prayer for our family, church, Emmanuel family. O oh Lord, we bring before you Emmanuel family, especially the friends we have not seen in church or Bible studies. I'm thinking personally of Peter and Jenny Aston and Nigel Cresset and others you may know. And a special thought for the future of Wednesday Fellowship after COVID-19. Be with those who we know have passed on, thinking of the families of Sylvia Holroyd, Noreen Longdon, Paul, Pauline Tappin and Derek Osborne, and two of my personal friends outside church, John Farrow and Bill Albrecht. We bring before you people of our church who have heart problems or other serious illnesses, I mentioned Ken and Margaret Mears, Gudrun Fickling, Jill Harvey, uh, and uh, Paul, uh, Jill Harvey, and Sue Oldfield, Heather McCulloch, Paul Hepworth, and Jane and Jeff Smith, and Helen Allsop. We give thanks for the recovery of Sally Woods from her ailments, and towards uh, uh, we give thanks for the, the for the thought for the day slot that's been. Put, for, put, put out and we give thanks for that and the pray and prayers, prayers, prayers praise and prayer diary always well, well put together by Mary Sayers and I begin to close our prayers by looking at today's entry which is Sunday the 22nd of November which we remember our prayer ministry tree, team and uh, those who live in Clare Court off of Rothamp Road and especially David and Rachel Phillips and family. So we give thanks for that chance to pray. Now today is, as I, uh, it's a colic for today, it's the 25th Sunday after Pentecost and the end of the church's year. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will is to restore things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings, Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be free and brought together under the most gracious rule who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the prayers, gathering our prayers and praise into one, our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, forgive us those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Graham, thank you so much for leading us in our prayers. We're now going to finish our service with our final hymn, Be Thou Our Vision, as Gareth leads us. Be Thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, 
be all else but naught to me save that thou art. Be thou my best thought in the day and the night, both waking and sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word, be thou ever with me, and I with thee, Lord. Be thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Be thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Be thou mine inheritance now and always. Be thou and thou only the first in my heart. O sovereign of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, bright sun, O oh, grant me its joys after victory is won. Great heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be thou my vision, O oh, It's been great to spend this time together together this morning. Please don't forget there's an opportunity to join us for our Zoom coffee morning at 11.30. Details, again, were in the church email. But now as we come to an end and we bring our service to a close, we finish with a prayer of blessing. So may the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts and the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Take care. God bless, and see you soon.